Osman Osman Rani, the man. Okay. Uh, <laughs> hey, good to be here. Yeah, look, I've known you a long time since the early two thousands. Ups I, and downs. Ups and downs. I, I first met you when you were at Average X, but right. then your career began with Astro and McKinsey before that, etc. Um, if we can start sure. the story right. with Stanford, you did your undergrad there, and I think you did a postgrad there as well, right? So this was before the whole dot com e-commerce yeah. boom, right? And so most people weren't thinking about Stanford, and even then, I think I probably got in on the diversity card. You You're think like, so? Oh, Malaysian? <laughs> oh, we don't really have Malaysian applicants. Um, Stanford was where Tiger Woods went, right? His freshman year was my senior oh. year. Okay, okay. So he's actually, well, he, he and you must be a similar age then. Yeah, he's about four years younger. Yeah. So talk about your past, Azran. Right. Um, are you one of those, you know, privileged upper middle class guys or did you come from a, you know, quite different background? Uh, I will definitely say I am privileged because uh, I had opportunities that I think a lot of people here don't. Yeah. Um, and, and namely, even something as simple as, uh, my parents, number one, being university lecturers, um, invested in books, one. Two, even more important, was they allowed me to speak. And even as, at an early stage when they would bring their friends um, home, right, they, they would ask me, right, contribute to the conversation. Right? Whereas normally kids are growing up and the parents just tell them, shut up and stay in the corner. Right? And that gave me the confidence to speak to adults, even as a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, an 11-year-old. Uh, so to me, that is privilege. It's not, not not necessarily money, but it's the you know the the bringing up in an environment where you learn to express yourself. The autonomy to express yourself, yeah. which is a very almost a Western concept, not an Asian concept. Um, I mean, you've done a lot in your life, right? You headed Erasure X. Um, you 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 started and, and I think you still advise iFlix, which is the Netflix yeah, thing. Sure. And then now you got Nullery as well. Some it, say some say a Rolling Stone gathers no moss, right? I, I, I don't no have a, a solid base. I just kind of fleet and move around. But you've done stuff, and I think you know obviously that that matters a, bit, a, a sure. great deal. Um, you know, so so obviously you've got a lot of um, uh, inspiration to impart to people. You've got a lot of um, advice to impart to people, and maybe we can start with uh, your years in Stanford, right? And then f from there onwards, because you were a scholar with Tanaga National, and obviously you would have shown a lot of promise to be a Tanaga National uh, scholar, right? I mean, what kind of things did you have at the time which you demonstrated that you were um, worthy of a scholarship? <laughs> you know, back in the old days, yeah. uh, you know. People didn't get nine A's for the SPM. It was it was a rare occurrence, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. So if you actually did, you you stood out. So um, today, I think the uh, you know there's a bit of grade inflation uh, going around, um, and I think um, yeah. So you know at that point, um, your your results allowed you to stand out because it was not common for people to have straight A's at at the SPM level. Yeah. Um, and uh, as I said, I think at, at interviews, I just felt more confident telling about my story because of my upbringing, right? Like uh, the ability to express and communicate, I think, uh, was probably a standout factor. Yeah, so I, I think that's what really set you apart because a lot of even young um, Asian leaders, they right. don't have that ability to, I mean, they may be very good, they might be very good technically. Right. They might be very good with the numbers and the, and the figures, but mm. they don't really express themselves very well. Um, was, that, was that the one thing that set you apart? I think so. And in fact, if there's uh, one or two things from Stanford that probably really influenced me. Yeah. First was at Stanford, your freshman year, everyone had to go through this one-year program called Cultures, Ideas, and Values. And what it was was you were in small groups, six, seven, eight people, and you had to read and discuss and debate all these greatest works, uh, you know, from... Uh, Shakespeare and Plato to the Bible and Quran and debate it, right? And first, as a Malaysian, it is mind-blowing, right? Number one, you've got to like read these things that you don't normally read and you've got to argue it out. Um, Formulate you know, opinions and, form and back and, it up. And basically there, you are meant to challenge what was written, right? Your normal education upbringing is, I'm good at memorizing and I will regurgitate what I learn, right? But here, the premise is you have to challenge all these books, all these authors, all these leaders, and come up with fresh new perspectives 
that doesn't exist today, right? And and that to me was um, something that I probably grew up the most, right? Being thrown into the environment, massive challenge where you got to completely overhaul how you think. So here's the thing. Um, what are the premises of this podcast? Mm. In my mind, was yep. never to um, trespass into a- areas of religion, right? Okay. Um, but um, when you when you t- when you tell me that right. um, you know one of the things that you learned in Stanford was right. to, to challenge notions, absolutely, and including yeah. the Bible and the Quran and yep. all that. W- one thing that is that strikes me about about religion in this country specifically yep. is that it's 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 non negotiable. Mm-hmm. What says goes, yeah. Yep. And if you speak up against it, you're in deep trouble. Yep. No question. Right. Um, from a productivity standpoint, right. from a, an ability standpoint, has that been um, an, an issue with our people, our, our young? Short answer is absolutely yes, because uh, when you suppress and you don't encourage debate and independent thinking early on, even if it's in one area, it's going to be very difficult to translate it to other areas, right? Um, and one of the big challenges we have as a society is we're not encouraging uh, people to have uh, different opinions and being able to argue it logically, right? It gets very emotional, it gets very dogmatic, black and white, right? Yeah. When in, in reality, life is 50 shades of gray. Correct. But then here's the thing, right? And mm. this is a bit of a strange notion because right. um, the whole issue about challenging, um, as you say, you know, in, in a typical Western culture uh, company, there's a lot of um, vocalization, there's a lot of pushback, there's a lot mm. of debate, a lot of table banging. Then right. on Friday night, everybody's mates and go right. for a beer down the pub, right? right? That's a very Western the notion, but yep. it's the 21st century. Right. We're in Asia now, right? right? Uh, China's a big thing, India's a big thing, Malaysia's yeah. a big thing. Right. Do we think that um, the Western notions of speaking out is, is outdated? Do you think there's a proposition for an Asian yeah. management style? Yes. Where everything is a bit more reserved and a bit more okay, um, so collaborative. This is, this is where we got to distinguish uh, form from function because um, how you speak up, the whole loud and table banging is just a method of communication and it may not be everyone's method, right? Uh, some people may express themselves poorly in, uh, in speech in a group setting but are much more articulate in one-on-one setting. Some people, it may be like, I really can't speak, but I need to write. But to me, the substance is um, encouraging people to have uh, their own viewpoints and be able to articulate it. And, and, but we, we need to have a more diverse, and maybe it is an Asian setting where you, know, you allow and foster different uh, opinions. Sometimes you have to recognize not everything can be decided in a big meeting because some people just genuinely will clam up, right? And if you write them off, oh, well, then you're not effective. You may be missing out on some cool perspectives, right? But so that, that we need have to differentiate between encouraging people to have good points of view, but acknowledging that people express those views in different points. That's different from saying you must just think and do the same way. So that's the delivery method, yes. right? And so the, the traditional Western notion is that, um, uh, yeah, you've got to speak up and be heard and, and be influ- influential among a whole bunch of people. Right. Um, but the Asian style is a bit more uh, collaborative. The Asian style is a bit more uh, behind closed doors, right. uh, one-on-ones. Um, face is a big thing, yep. right? And, you know, I mean, I've had... Um, People who work in Scandinavian corporations tell me that they, there's a big cultural difference, Absolutely. right? You know, the Danish come out here, the Norwegians or the Icelandic, they come out here and they're very direct confrontational right. people. Sure. And they'll tell you that your work sucks, but right. then on, on Friday night, you all, have, you all will go down to the pub right. and have a beer. It's really weird to the Asian thing. Now, see, the thing is, Malaysia, we're famous for a lot of things, you know, our nasi lemak, we can debate with the Singaporeans about that, but, you know, <laughs> uh, we have the highest power distance culture in the world. The Hofstadt power dis- distance right. ratio. Um, and f- surprisingly, even more than the Japanese or Koreans. Uh, Which is crazy, right? But as leaders, what that means is we have to adapt. So, for example, you cannot say, well, you know, I've got an open door policy. Come to me if you've got an idea problem. Like, no one comes to you with uh, a problem or idea. Or you say, management by walkabout. You walk about your office. Chong, how's everything today? Good boss, good boss. Like, they're not telling you the things that are freaking them out inside. Yeah. Or you have a town hall meeting. All right, team. This week, uh, this month, we're focused here. Any questions? 
right? No one's putting up their hand except that one smart aleck who just wants attention. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can say as a leader, I've done my job. Yeah. You've got to go beyond that, right? And one of the things we have to recognize is because our workforce cultures have these uh, sort of social inhibitors, right? We've got to think differently as leaders. And one of the things we did at both AirAsia X and iFlix is the concept of what we call honesty hour, where you create the safe space and initially it was something as simple as write any question, any problem, uh, any criticism on a piece of paper. And as a leader, I'm committed to give you a 100% brutal, honest uh, response, right? And people are going to judge us. If we just simply try to do corporate wash, next time they're not going to bring up any things, right? And it's scary as a leader when suddenly, you know, when people are given that safety of anonymity, things like, oh, are we going to be retrenched, right? Are we going to run out of cash? Um, The CFO is having an affair with that, that manager. What's our policy on CFOs having an affair? Like, that's tough shit you got to <laughs> answer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but by doing so, suddenly you, you do encourage uh, things to come up. I'll give you, you know, one of my favorite stories is uh, in the airline business, uh, you know, some department heads don't like problems to come up because they, they think that reflects badly on them, right? And they put subtle pressure to keep their team members uh, compliant. So for example, with flight attendants, if you dare speak up and bring up a complaint to Azran or the top management team, I will make you work on Chinese New Year, I will make you work on Raya, or the worst is, I will put five Hangzhou flights in a row on your roster, right? Because that's the worst flight, right? It leaves (laughs) KL at 7 p.m., arrives in Hangzhou at midnight, you gotta stay there one hour and then fly back 1 a.m., arrive in KL at 6 a.m. That is a shit uh, roster to to do so, right? So naturally with that kind of pressure, people just shut up and just get their work done. But when we created the safe space where people could anonymously bring up stuff, then you see complaints come up, right? Um, but first, it's scary as a leader. And second, you realize, shit, I don't know how, I, number, one, number one, I never knew we had these problems. But number two, I don't know what to do with it. But that's where by making, bringing it out in the open, uh, we discovered, oh, actually, you know, sometimes I'll give you one interesting problem, right? A flight attendant would complain, how come, uh, one out of every three flights, there is always a passenger who needs wheelchair assistance, right? And like half the time, why can't the ground operations team get their act together and have the wheelchair ready when our plane comes in? Because when it's not there and it takes like 20 minutes late, 30 minutes late, guess what? The, the passenger who needs that wheelchair is screaming at me, the flight attendant, right? I've just finished my shift. I'm tired. I want to go home. I'm going to put up with this uh, irate passenger. So why can't the goddamn ground operations team get their act together? And, and so usually you blame one department, right? And of course, what's the ground operations team's reaction? They get yeah. very defensive. Oh, you know, well, what the problem is, you know, <laughs> not enough budget, not enough headcount. That's always a problem with our, with our teams, right? Because, you know, we don't have enough budget and headcount to have wheelchairs and team members ready at every gate. We've got to like make tactical adjustments. And it's the flights. The flights don't come on time all the time. They're, they're late, right? So you got to make all these tactical choices. So two departments are talk, talking over each other's heads and just blaming each other or blaming the external circumstance. And I'm still like, screw it. Like, shit, I don't know what to do, right? <laughs> but because we created it out in the open, suddenly the engineers go, hey, interesting. I never knew you guys had this problem. Hey, you know what? Here's a crazy idea, right? Because... Whatever time the plane comes in, whether it's early, on time, or late, the one thing that's always will be there is the engineering van. Because in the engineering van is the guy with the two lollipops, right? Who oh, yeah, guides yeah, yeah. the plane to a complete stop, thumbs up, then the aero bridge comes in, right? So what if we had a backup foldable wheelchair that we keep in the engineering With van? With a lollipop man. So, so that you, flight attendant, if you ever face this situation, you come down, get the backup wheelchair, sort the passenger out, and let the ground operations team catch up. See, the thing is, if you're flight attendants and you're ground ops, you don't think about the engineering resources because it's not part of your department, right? So the problem we have in our culture is we're very siloed, we're very hierarchical, we don't want to speak up, and when we are finally given an opportunity to speak up, you basically just kind of like, okay, let's just whack all the problems. So would it be true to say that that's one of the reasons why Malaysia Airlines is still in such a heap of dog shit? Um, Pro- <laughs> Proton until recently was in a heap of dog shit. And so many other kind of like um, monolithic corporations are in that heap of dog shit. But you know, to be constructive about this whole issue, 
um, we're not in this 21st century. Right. Um, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs and business people. Um, it's a very different place, right? Um, the, the freelance economy is huge. The gig economy is in full effect. And a lot of the time, you work with people that you never see. You're always on them with WhatsApp and on FaceTime, and that's right. it, right? right. How do you how do you get get over these things? I mean, if you're starting a business or yep. running running a small startup business, right. right? You've got these people on your payroll, right? No one to get any of, any of that stuff. Sure. How do you get around it? So, so the first thing is, if you're small, you don't have balance sheet, you don't have brand, you don't have distribution, you don't have shit. The only thing that you have that is the, your one real advantage is your ability to move faster than the big guys. That is your only advantage. And if you don't do that, you have nothing. And so. For me, that's why you, you keep emphasizing how is it that we've got to move faster, right? And it's that's why you know we move away from 12-month plans. We've got to do things in short bursts of one to two-week sprints. But also, more importantly, speed is about two-way communications, right? So every organization is good at the CEO saying, this is what we need to do, top down. But your ability to move faster than your bigger competitors is if the bottom-up stuff moves up. Right? Because that means your guys who are dealing with uh, on the front line with customers or operations, whatever problems, it has to surface up faster than how it moves in big organizations, right? Because there's a lot of these organizational friction. And so that's why things like the honesty hour system and so many of the practices that we do are key. But it requires a different way of running the business, right? And you, if you take a traditional way, these, these big GLCs who are running, you know, like a fiefdoms and you know I sit in my big corporate office and I wait for monthly reports and monthly reviews um, you're not gonna solve it so if you have a monthly review with the engineering team they're only gonna talk about that you have a separate one with the flight operations team they're gonna so you'd never see that cross functionality and by the time issues come up it takes months to turn it into a new initiative and, and to change yeah right so Another example, right? Yeah. So from this process, initially, the concept of low-cost carriers is we keep things very, very simple to minimize complexity. And so on an AirAsia X flight or an AirAsia flight at that point, right, uh, for onboarding sales, the only currencies we would accept is either Malaysian ringgit or the currency of the uh, destination country, right? So if we flew to Australia, we only accept Aussie dollars. Now, one of the big things that we really smashed uh, the, the way the old AirAsia and low-cost carrier mindset was this thing about point-to-point -point flights, right? They were deathly afraid of uh, connecting flights because that added complexity. So if you were from Penang and you wanted to go to Bali, you bought Penang KL and separate ticket KL Bali. And if for any reason your Penang KL flight was late, you're all screwed. You just missed the flight and you got to buy a new ticket, right? And so at AirAsia X, we challenged that. We said, look, if we could connect people and find a way to do that while keeping costs low, we're going to open up a whole new market segment. And we did. Over 50% of our passengers are connecting. But on board, suddenly now, right, on our flight to Australia, we now have Indonesians and Thais who come in from Bangkok and Jakarta, come to KL and take a connecting flight to Sydney, right? They just got on the flight and they're like, okay, it's an eight-hour flight. I'm hungry. I want to buy stuff. I don't have ringgit. I don't have Aussie dollars. I've got rupiah, right? And so they get pissed off. Like, why? I'm hungry. I want to buy. Yeah. I can't. I can't buy, right? Yeah. And the flight attendants are upset as well because, sorry, sir, company policy. We don't accept that currency, and um, and so they're upset because flight attendants make a lot of money from sales commission, right? At least ten percent of of your sales. I didn't know that. Right? I didn't know that. So they yeah. want to sell, yeah. but they can't because company policy says we don't accept currencies, right? Yeah. And so it. It finally came to us because of this honesty out process. Otherwise, it would have been a problem that just festered in stupid rumors and gossip amongst the flight attendants bitching about management. Yeah. But when it finally came out, we were like, oh shit, what are we going to do, right? Because the, the, then we were like, yeah, actually, we've got, we fly to all these countries, so we know all the exchange rates. How difficult can it be to just put it all in one sheet so that flight attendants all have one standard exchange rate, right? And then finance will go, oh, you know, well, complicated or we need to change forms and all of that right and so what what did we do we said okay look finance how long do you think it'll take you to get new forms and printed this oh two months okay you can have fun and take two months to do it but we're going to implement this this was on a friday afternoon on monday morning this is going to get implemented and flight attendants you just handwrite it right and you just Easy. use a simple that, calculator yeah. right so when they finally saw that problems could be turned into solutions and were practical right that's how you know more more sales 
uh, more engaged staff because they feel that they can raise a problem and it's going to get attended to. But in a traditional way you run a business, you're going to miss out on these things because they're going to remain buried by your frontline staff, right? Yeah. And that's the one advantage we have as a small company is, and frankly, big companies can do that, but they don't. They're too hierarchical. Yeah, so um, obviously it's, it's going to be quite clear that over the span of the next 50 years, say, right, a lot of the GLCs and state-owned enterprises that we know now, they're going to crumble, no question. They're going to be dying natural, quite fast deaths. Um, it is also an opportunity for the young guy to come out and say, hey, I'm going to come in and disrupt markets because there's obviously so much to disrupt, yep. whether it's in the field of financial services or construction or property. I, tell, I hear people all the time in my line of work telling me how crappy and how inefficient their industries are, right? right? There's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur now. Right. No question, right. right? What would your advice be to the budding entrepreneur now? The top three things, right, that you can tell them, uh, these are the things you must do. Well, let's be, before we get to that, right, yeah. since you brought up, because uh, we're uncensored, right? So I want to yeah, yeah. go, you know, uh, iFlix and Astro. Okay, right? exactly, right? Good, good um, example. Where... Astro is screwed, right? Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> well, Rohan is a good friend and all, but, you know... And that, that you used to work there. Yep, so here's the, here's the thing, right? They know that the core business is being eroded. People are moving away from traditional TV to online TV. But one of the challenges is this, like, quarterly mindset. Because, oh, you know, we have to report our quarterly earnings. So why would I you know, encourage my customers to give up a hundred ringgit a month subscription to sell them a 10 ringgit a month online subscription. I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to cannibalize myself, right? Yeah. Because I've got to meet my quarterly targets. And if I actively encourage people to move to a 10 ringgit solution, all oh, business is going to uh, collapse. But you know what? It is anyway, right? They've, they've lost 50% anyway. of, their, of their market value and they're still not changing. They're still pushing... Uh, set top boxes when you know our mobile phones today have far more computing power than the set top boxes set top boxes are archaic right like why would I need a box for this room and I need another box for another room right when my phone I can move and even if I have a flat screen TV my, my phone can basically project to it but because they've got inventory they've got sales they've got distribution they're not they just can't like it's deer in headlights it's happening in their face share price is crashing but they can't just bite the bullet and say, you know what, screw it, this doesn't work, I've got to... Too much at stake, do you think? Because, no, well, I mean, I've got a story right, for you, Razvan. Right. Mm. Six years ago, I tried, I tried to cut my Astro subscription. Mm. They made it so difficult for me. Right. Childbirth was easier than cutting my Astro subscription. They made it so difficult. Right. I, I, ultimately, what I did was I went to Facebook. Right. I told them I was a member of the medium. Right. I, I, I said that the hell of... The, the fury of hell will, 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 will right. lash out upon you and I'll talk about your stuff on radio and, and, and within half an hour, it was cut, right? Because th they knew they couldn't screw with me because I was, I was a journalist, mm. right, essentially, right. right? They made it so difficult for me. But then, a couple of years after that, Netflix came along, right? right? And Netflix allows you to have just three plans. Yep. The cheap, the middle, and the not so cheap. And then at any point in time, you can just cut off and come back anytime. That's right. And then today I've got I've got this the top I I, I buy the top plan at yep. forty five bucks sure. or whatever right? right, five users right. so my father in law in Penang can listen sure. to, can watch it, my mum in Penang can watch it and three of us in in KL can watch it. So fantastic. So exactly that's why they are killing Astro. To to come back to that that startup entrepreneur, my one point is we have to be obsessed about these problems. Uh, I think far too many entrepreneurs are more in love with their product. I've got this idea, I've got this product, and you tend to basically you go around with a hammer and everything is a nail, right? But actually to me, it's about, you know, what are these frustrations that people out there are facing, right? Whether it's customer service with your um, satellite TV company or just all, you know, like being obsessed with the problem allows us to say, look, you know what? Version of the one of the product, virtually no one has a version one of the product which is great right you've got to change your product multiple times but what doesn't change is the specific problem that you're trying to solve and how you're going to change people's lives for the better think about facebook facebook today is this big giant remember yeah. version one of facebook when all it could do is just poke yeah, yeah. not a lot of stuff right That's there right. was no video nothing That's right. uh, but you know it's not about being obsessed with our solution but being obsessed with 
the problem that we're trying to solve. And it's about, you know, having a good feel for, you know, where people's pain, pain points are and all of that. I'll, I'll give you another example, right? Um, example of us at AirAsia X doing something that no airline in the world had ever done before. Um, you know how you fly on economy, especially on long-haul flight? You come, you get your seat, you sit down, and you hope and pray nobody comes and sits next to you. Yeah. Right? You can <laughs> relate to it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody. And, and, and if you get you get three seats in a row, you're like, oh, jackpot, right? <laughs> or if someone does come and sit next to you, you know what you do? You start scanning the plane, <laughs> scanning the plane. Oh, got, got new empty row. The moment the seatbelt sign goes off, poof, Bam. Um, yeah. sweater, book, like my territory, right? Like you, it's a big jackpot. But here's the thing. Um, on average, a plane is only 80% full, so which means on average, 20% of the seats are empty. Right? But you can't pre-sell someone three seats in a row because what happens if on that day uh, a big sales convention goes on, they, they buy all the last minute seats at the highest price. You don't want to give up that revenue opportunity. Yeah. Right? So what we did was we say, first of all, identify that is a latent unmet need. Customers uh, have that uh, uh, need. Right? So what if we created a financial option where you pay a small fee, 10, 20, 30 US dollars for a chance, not a guarantee to get all three seats in a row. The way it works is when you check in, if on that day, oh, we've got empty seats, we're going to put on your boarding pass 27A, B, C, so you can confidently swagger on the plane knowing that you get all three seats in a row for just a small price. But if on that day we've sold every seat, we say, sorry, Chuang, can't exercise your option, here's your 20 bucks back. Right? That's right, that money goes straight to the bottom line because those seats are fungible. It would have flown empty, right? And no airline thought about it this way because what do big companies do? They focus on their competition, or they do that campaign. They do that campaign as opposed to putting ourselves in the customer's shoes. And see, when I describe the problem to you, you could immediately relate Absolutely. to it, right? Absolutely. But why would any airline thinking about that? Right? It's like a telco. Um, you know, everyone will, oh, what's DG doing versus what's Max is doing? Oh, they've got that plane. Let's respond with this uh, campaign. Let's re respond with this price. But you know, one thing that's kicked every telco's ass was WhatsApp, right? It completely it's decimated killable. voice and, and SMS revenue. Yeah. So it didn't come from your competition. It came from a nothing uh, entity that didn't exist uh, a while ago, right? And that's the, the problem with the corporate mindset of, Oh, we must benchmark, we must do competitor analysis, we, we look at that campaign, how do we respond? So you're only thinking in incremental one to two market share percentage points without realizing in the world today, a nothing nobody WhatsApp can come in and completely shake things up. So you must have seen a lot through the years. Um, Lost all my hair in that process. <laughs> I've never known you with hair actually, to be honest. Um, uh, yeah. you, should, you should check out the... Astro Annual Report 2005 2006 Bursa Malaysia 2004 I think you had where, that. you know I was still in denial the hairline was receding <laughs> but I had this comb over thing and at that point I was fat so my face was round so like 15 years ago I looked 15 years older than I do today shit dude you're fat I've never known you as fat yeah right serious right 5 inches on my waistline dude my gosh okay Iron Man we're gonna talk about that after this wait <laughs> okay, wait all right. okay so um so how many GLCs will be gone in 10 years? How many corporations that we know of will be gone in 10, 15 years? Because you're right, you're right. WhatsApp has killed everybody. It's killed the phone call as we know it. So to me, it's, you know, it's not about a linear prediction, right? Because it's about when you're going to wake up and realize that you can't run things uh, the way you do. Because, for example, if... Uh, if you actually genuinely had someone who was going to be much, you know, run these companies in a different way, they have massive advantages. They have massive advantages um, with the money and the balance sheet and the network, but it just requires that different leadership style. Yeah. You can turn things around. Yeah. I'll, give you, I'll give you another example that's outside of Malaysia just for fun, right? Uh, Amazon Go. You heard of it? Amazon Go. Amazon Go. No. So, Amazon, big online uh, retailer, right? That's right. Are now getting into physical retail space, or even supermarkets. They're creating their own supermarkets. Crazy. Right? So brick and mortar. Brick and mortar. And someone from the outside comes in. They look at, ah, oh, okay, what is the pain point that people experience in supermarkets today? Well, the fact that once you get what you want, you got to line up at the checkout counter, take everything out, pay, then put everything back in bags and go out, right? Imagine if you didn't have to do any of that, right? You just walk in, just take whatever you want and just walk out, 
right? Because of sensors and everything, it can detect whatever you want and it automatically deducts it. So just zap that. your credit card, that's it? No, not even. It's just straight from your phone. Okay. So you don't even have to take out a credit card or anything because your e-wallet, it senses it, poof, it just de deducts your balance straight that's up, so right? fascinating. So they did the first trial in Seattle, launched it. Put Gotta be great, Seattle, great, right? Great video in uh, on YouTube. Yeah. But the story is this. So I'm not going to name uh, a, a giant global giant retailer, their senior executive team, watched the video and went, ah, oh, we had that idea three years ago. Walmart? Was it Walmart? Well, <laughs> no. The main point though is sometimes big companies, they have the ideas themselves, but why did they not implement it? Right? Oh, well, we, you know, what is the risk management plan and the business continuity plan? What happens if someone doesn't have the app and they just walk in and they just steal everything and walk out, what's going to happen, right? So you think about all these uh, negative scenarios and you end up not implementing it. So here's the thing. Uh, it's been almost two years since the first Amazon Go store in Seattle. Last January when I was in San Francisco, I visited Amazon Go in San Francisco and guess what? Amazon still hadn't figured out the security issue. So till today, they still have to have security guards at the entrance to check whether <laughs> you've got the app, right? So the pain point is they didn't let the fact that they haven't solved that part of the problem stop them from I executing, see, I right? See, I see. You just go out there because you're going to learn and improvise everything. But the problem that big companies have is they have this procedure that every plan must be well thought through, scenarios, all these things and you end up not executing, right? Because you're always thinking about downside. Because when you're big, you're worried about downside, right? But when you're small, the one advantage we have is we are not worried about having our ass kicked and nothing happens because we just yeah. bill again. Yeah. So you take that risk, right? But Amazon's a big company. But the mindset is, even if we haven't figured out all the things, we launch anyway. And we're gonna learn by doing, because that's the only way you learn in today's world, not by having a perfect plan, 100 page, you know, uh, PowerPoint presentation, bounded, colored slides, you know, like that shit doesn't make business, no, right? It, it is yeah. going out there and getting your hands dirty. Do you think entrepreneurs are made and not um, uh, born? Because, yeah, because Malaysia has done really well. I mean, you, t you talk about Malaysia and Singapore all the time, right. but Singapore's got no entrepreneurs. Well, there, there are, but not as many as Malaysia. Right. And Malaysia's got so yeah. many... Once right? we become successful, we become Singaporean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't mention Anthony Tan's name, did you? No, oh, I, I there's, there's I, more I than that. There's more <laughs> than that, yeah. Yeah, but, um, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah. There's so many inefficiencies in Malaysia that every single turn, every single corner you turn, there's an opportunity to upend an sure. existing business. Right. Do, do you think entrepreneurs are made um, and not born? Well... To me, it's a moot point. I'm, I'm not fussed about the, the answer to that because uh, when we talk about made, it goes all the way back to your childhood. And your cultural background Correct, right? and all that. And, and if you had, um, you know, if you're given that opportunity to speak up and be creative in a way that is nurture rather than nature, but it's a big part of what makes, uh, makes, it, makes it work, right? So... Uh, I, you know, I don't think anyone can conc conclusively prove that, uh, um, and, well, actually one argument why, um, you know, it is not made is because, you know, take the conventional Chinese, you know, the third generation is going to screw yeah. everything up. Yeah. Well, if you're made, then you're genetically, you should be a much better entrepreneur yeah. every time around, yeah. but you're yeah. not. But you're not. Right? So, because by the time the third generation comes up, they're comfortable. There's no more hunger, Right. Um, but the first generation is the one that has to go through all that shit and it's having to go through that shit that makes you a great entrepreneur yeah um, you know what I was thinking about was that um, how how um, how because there's so many inefficiencies in Malaysia uh, and, and, and there's opportunities everywhere right um, the thing is you can do business in Malaysia, right? And right. it's a 31 million market. Yep, it's, not um, small. it's not small, but it's not huge either, right? Yep. And you talk about Amazon Go. Amazon Go is a 230 million market. Billion. Right? Billion. Yeah. Sorry, so it's a, it's a population of 230 million. US. US, right? It's more than 300 already. Sorry, 300. 330 or, or yeah. thereabouts. Right? Sorry. <laughs> you know your numbers more than I do. Um, so the perennial right. uh, issue facing entrepreneurs in Malaysia right. is the size of the market, right? 31 million people, yes. very fragmented, 60% right. Malay, 30% Chinese or 20% right. that, and 10% Indian, right. and then some speak English, some speak right. Bahasa, right. and da-da-da, right? 
I think to some extent, AirAsia X solved the, the, the regionalization yeah. business uh, model. But if you try to start a business, right, mm. how would you solve, crack that conundrum? Well, Be- first, first for me is the mindset that you are, why are you limiting yourself to Malaysia? And interestingly, yeah. the only reason why someone like iFlix can thrive is the fact that for decades, media companies, whether it's print or broadcast, thought of themselves as national companies, right? As big as Astro is, they're yeah. only big in Malaysia. As yeah. big as Indivision is, only in Indonesia, right? Singapore, uh, media, Singapore press, only in Singapore. TVB in Hong Kong, only in Hong Kong. Because it was regulated, it was licensed, you stay in your individual market, right? And so your whole mindset is, you know, how do I maximize how much revenue I can get for the consumers in this market? Whereas iFlix comes in and says, actually with the internet, all geographic boundaries uh, completely fall down, right? So I can just, even if I get two cents per customer per month, but if I have 100 million customers across 30 countries, that can still work, right? And it's going to be a real game changer if you drive down pricing by tenfold, not 20% cheaper, 50% cheaper, but by, by, by tenfold. But that requires you from day one, you know, we were laughed at 100 plus investors rejected us. Uh, for many reasons, but one of the reasons was we said, well, we want to serve a billion people in emerging markets. And they said, what drugs are you on? Because Netflix, after 15 years, is only 100 million customers. And you're five guys in Mid-Valley Mega Mall and you want to take on Silicon Valley? But it's that mindset from day one saying, we have to put in the foundations to, to be in multiple markets. So how does an iFlix take on Netflix? Because iFlix is still, you know, kind of sure. still on the fringe sure. a little bit, right? Right. It's a very good question because... The other main reason why we were rejected over 100 times is because, you know, in hindsight, why did they reject us? Because all of these investors are what I call Bangsa Kiara Damansara demographic, right? Or Singapore demographic. They are urban, English speaking. They love sophisticated shows, US presidential power struggles, Colombian drug cartels, white lesbians in prison. They have (laughs) big flat screen TVs. Fiber broadband at home, they pay by credit card, right? And they've got a $1,000 US dollar smartphone. So to them, they're like, well, there's no need for another iFlix because there's already Netflix and it's I'm a Netflix consumer, so I don't see a need for an inferior product. What they don't realize is Bangsa Kiara Damansara is 10% of the market, right? It's 5% in Indonesia and it's 2% in Vietnam and Myanmar. The moment you step out, right, the rest of the population cannot connect with that content. They, their problems, their technical problems is I only have a small screen phone. It's a sub one megabit per second uh, bandwidth, right? It's not about ultra high def and 4K technology. It's a completely different problem you solve. Now, living in Bangsa Kera Damansara, you might think everyone is either MU, Chelsea, uh, uh, Liverpool or Arsenal, right? Because that is your bubble. But you know what? In Malaysia alone, for every one MU, Chelsea, Liverpool, Arsenal fan, there are five fans of Malaysian football. Right? But uh, the guys in, uh, in, in KL, you ask them to name one single player in, on the Malaysia football team, they have no idea. But no they can idea. name the 11 starting, starting 11 of MU. Right? That is how disconnected we are from the mass market. And so the reason why um, you know, iFlix thrives is because the iFlix proposition is completely different from the Netflix proposition. Right? It is Malaysian football. It is not um, EPL. It is... Korean dramas and local shows, it is not, uh, you know, uh, House of Cards, right? Yeah. So um, that's what these investors fail to see. And that's the problem with a lot of people is we tend to think only based on our own biases and our own experiences. And we, we judge consciously or subconsciously, right? It's thinking differently. When did Asran Osman Rani become the... Um um, you know, the influencer, right? The inspirer, the, you know, the, the speaker of, of, at, at, on, on stage podiums to 2,000 people. When did you become that person? Because that's what you, it appears you've morphed into. Out of necessity, two yeah. things. One, um, selling the idea of a low-cost, long-haul model when everyone, all the experts in the global airline industry said it can never be done, right? And to take it to IPO, it's no longer about (coughs) pitching to a select number of investors who are going to privately back you, but you want to go to IPO, you got to go around the world and pitch the idea to um, all these institutional investors to kind of convince them that they should invest in your stock. And you learn by trial and error. The other thing, frankly, that that gave me the opportunity is that, um, you know, Tony is an amazing speaker and he loves to just say yes to people when people invite him. But most of the time, he's a last minute, he's going to pull out. 
right? And, <laughs> so and, that you la- and, lands and, uh, on your lap. Uh, yeah, so I, I get, well, you know, sorry, Tony can't make it, but, you know, we've got Asran, you know, the, <laughs> the kind of the, the backup guy. And when you're thrust in that situation, you learn, you adapt, you improvise, you get better because you have to keep doing it all the time. So you 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 mold you molded like a you know like um like animals they they change they change forms and what have you learned from that from this from this transformation because it's been very as you say you used right. to be fifteen kg heavier right. you had hair now you don't have hair now you're a triathlete right. um, where where before you were overweight right this this transformation people change all the time but subtly but yours has been quite extreme. See, it's it's always interesting when people say it's extreme. What they may not see is. You know, like with a lot of successes, you think people are instant, instantaneously yeah. successful. You don't see that the, the 10 years before they, they came into the, the spotlight, yeah. you know, a lot of shit went through. Yeah. Like they, they, they go through it, right? Yeah. And um, you take even um, weight loss, right? So here's the thing, right? Um, so I used to be a competitive athlete in university. And then 10 years as a management consultant, you work 80 hours a week. You are traveling Monday morning, come back uh, Friday night. You have dinners at the hotel room at 10 p.m., steak, and you know, and uh, boom, you know, with the stress, uh, you, you balloon up. Um, and uh, so the trigger first was someone invited me to play futsal, right? And I'm like, okay, sure, I can play futsal. I lasted three minutes. I went, <laughs> and futsal the other is guys, no joke. right? The other guys were like 40 years old, smokers, and they were just laughing at me. And so, shit, man, I gotta get my act together, okay? I gotta, I gotta get back in shape and I'm gonna eat healthier and all that. But you know what? Even with that spark and desire to change, nothing happened for over two years. Because if you think about it, it's not easy. Because if you've accumulated 10 years of bad habit, you think, you know, in two months of changing, the body's gonna somehow miraculously change. And that's where most people give up, right? Because we are like this instant gratification culture. I do something, I don't see results in 30 days, screw it, I'm, I'm not interested anymore, right? Yeah. Um, but it's the changes that you don't see, it's like that iceberg underneath the surface. If you keep at it for two years, suddenly after two years, boom, everything uh, came, came together. But it's the ability to kind of stick at it for that first two years that I think makes the difference. What gave you the willpower, the determination to continue? Because a lot of people have the willpower of a piece of paper. They just right. let it crumble. Yeah, so, so I'm not a believer in willpower. I'm not a believer in uh, determination and all of that because all of us have a finite supply. Some people give up after one week. Some people give up after three months. Uh, because if you consciously focus on, I need to change, um, it doesn't work. So it's really, if you know, uh, if you start to understand what would it take to change, interestingly, it is not willpower and determination, right? So I'll give you kind of a bit of, a, of a, like a neuroscience story, right? In simple terms, our brain has two basic parts, the prefrontal cortex in front here and the limbic system at the back, right? The prefrontal cortex is where your rational thoughts, decisions, plans, and willpower, yeah, I'm gonna do this, that all happens here. The limbic system is your subconscious, your emotions, the things that are running on autopilot, right? As a relative point, if there are 100 synaptic connections happening at one minute in the front, how many do you think are happening at the back at the same minute? A lot more. I can't tell how many more. Pick, pick a number. A hundred times more. See, you're Malaysian, right? you got to think one MDB big. <laughs> like 2.6 billion times, times more. Right, from 100, 2.6 billion. That is Shit, dude. That's huge. Right, so, so what chance does this have if this, you know, you can say, I'm going to lose weight. The back says, we always have our nasi kanda every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Like, <laughs> you just don't have a chance, yeah. right? Um, and that's why at some point most people give up. Yeah. So the trick is to figure out, well, how do I move something from something that I'm consciously doing to something that is just routine automatic habits? And this is where you got to understand how do habits work? And habits is not just an action. There are actually three parts to a habit. What's the original trigger? What is the action? And what's kind of the reward that you get from it? So I'll give an example. In our normal workplace, right? At 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, ah, go to the canteen or the mama and have my mi goreng and teh tarik, right? It's like trigger, 3, 3.30, action, I get, uh, I get my mi, mi mama and teh tarik, I, I get a break and I feel good afterwards, right? That is a habit. So you cannot just simply say, well, no more teh tarik or, you know, there's something that pulls you off. And you got to kind of do a few things to understand, okay, why 3 to 3.30? Well, actually, because 
after lunch, right after one or two hours of staring at the computer screen, like you really need a break. But if the reward perhaps is that break and the social connection, what if we could substitute the action but still get the same reward? So for example, uh, instead of going to the canteen, I'm gonna go over to my friend's desk and you know we're gonna have some peanuts there and we're gonna just shoot the breeze and come back. And suddenly you realize, oh, actually that's I right, good, yeah. right? So if you can achieve that same reward by responding to the trigger in a different action, you can start to override it, right? And that's why it's not willpower. It is just kind of understanding what are what's behind this thing and, and kind of slowly doing small incremental changes, but fast, Yeah. right? And then there's a small hop, skip and a jump from that to say, hey, instead of going for a beer at five o'clock, let's go and get our stuff on, let's go for a ride. One exactly. hour ride, right? And because, then you still get the same interaction. the reward is actually the social connection. That's right. Right? The food was just a way of doing it, right? Yeah. So if you say, I still want the social connection, but I'm just going to do something different. So I know it's good. Yeah. So how do you go from that overweight management consultant guy to someone who does Ironmans? And you've done Langkawi, right? Uh -huh. Ironmans are no fucking joke, right? Ironmans are like it's a four k swim. It's a four and a half k swim. To illustrate it, and okay. So one, one of the things I learned is you got to give something that people can respond. Yeah. Because if I tell you four k, one eighty k, forty two k, most people yeah. don't get it. Right? Don't but get if it. I tell you start in Pulau Pangko, swim to Lumut, cycle to Sungai Bulo, and then run to Putrajaya all in one day. <laughs> go, oh. Before sundown. <laughs> right. So you start at sunrise and you got to try to finish by sundown. That's crazy. Right. I mean, how painful is it to train for and to participate in an Ironman? Yeah. So because you can't, you can't just walk in, right? You no, no, you can't. You got to qualify. Right? Well, um, Langkawi, you got to qualify, no, no, right? No, no, no. You, you technically don't. You, anyone can sign up, but you must finish in seventeen hours. So before midnight, you have to finish. Yeah. And and there's this big tradition in Ironman. So if, races. if you if you finish after midnight, what happens? Uh, literally, you so, don't get your medal. So you know, what, what, yeah, and this is very strict, right? So. Uh, even if you finish early before sunset, there's this tradition, everybody comes back at midnight nice. to cheer the last guys on because in Iron Man world, at 1701, you are not an Iron Man. It is a strict cutoff. Fuck. It's not like these local races where, Fuck. oh, I don't make the cutoff. I still want my t-shirt because I paid for it. Bullshit. Iron Man, you got to earn it at that, nice. at that hour, right? Nice. Um, so, but that's, that's what makes it special. How does it feel to participate in an Iron Man? How painful is it? Yeah, you know, to me, it's a bit like my drug. Uh, it's, yeah. you, know, we, you know, if you think about it, uh, same thing, right? Like uh, for some people, it's cigarettes. For some people, it's, it's drugs. But there is this state that you're in, like this release that you crave, right? Um, and, and for me, uh, Iron, the Ironman race itself is just a small tip of the iceberg. It is that lifestyle of regularly training. And for me... It is my meditation. It is my alone time because when I run, when I cycle, like it's my time to process, you know, all the screwed up things that are happening in my head. How do I make sense of it? Because if I don't have that escape, life is too complicated. Yeah. Things are moving fast, stiff stuff happening at home, at work, and you just don't have time to get away and try to make sense of it. And so by kind of having my time, that is my time to figure shit out. So would it be right to say that at, even now, at any point in time, you're ready to go and participate because you're, you're in the condition that you can you, to participate is that is that true and if so how how do you keep in trim ah. because you got a full day right you got yeah, meetings yeah, and yeah. what have you so first of all there are seasons you cannot be uh fit and ready to race 365 days of the year okay. it just doesn't work right the body needs time to adapt and so like for, for example in my in my case uh if if this year the big season is langkawi and langkawi is in november after the race, I just take the rest of the year up to December and just veg and just like not think about it and let your body just kind of loosen up a bit, right? Yeah. Then you slowly rebuild in January, pick it up, recover, pick it up and recover. And you got to time it right so that you're peaking for that one big so race. So every year, every year you, you do Langkawi once? So, sometimes I've, I've, done, I've done Taiwan, I've done... Um, Australia, um, so a bit of variety, um, but you gotta, you know, so do you still do the, just fun because it's you still do the small race. races in between. A lot less. Some yeah. some people are more more active, but for yeah. example, this year I said I'm gonna do go back to Borneo Marathon, 28 nice. April this month. That was the first race that got me into this because you know I was still relatively chubby my first year at Air Asia X, and then the first inaugural Borneo Marathon was in 2008. 
and uh, I just signed up for the 10K, you know, trying to rally my team. Hey guys, let's support this race and let's go out there and have fun. And you kind of huff and puff over 10K. And then you finish the race and you look at these grandmothers and grandfathers who are finishing the full 42K kilometer marathon. You go, ah, oh, shit, that's amazing, man. I'm in so much pain for 10K. They've just done that more than four times over. And you see the big smiles in their face. Yeah. Right. And number one, yeah, you know, I, I really want to do that. But here's the problem again. You think you want to do that. And the next race, okay, I'm going to sign up for this 15K uh, run at uh, Bukit Tunku. You know what happened at the end of the 15K race? I collapsed and had to be rescued by St. John's Ambulance. You. Because I had no idea what I was doing, right? You just kind of like run and run and run. You. Yeah. You, you collapsed. When was that? Uh, like within a few months after that first Borneo Marathon. Well, so this is way back when. Yeah, like, yeah okay. 2009, right? Okay. Because I didn't know what I was doing, right? So people think, oh yeah, I'm going to run. And, and the, the biggest mistake anyone makes trying to pick up running is when they're training for it, they're running. This is, this is counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. to train for a marathon and to get faster, you've got to learn by running slower. It's so counterintuitive. Most people just go, what? That doesn't make sense. Yeah. I've got to run faster. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, and, and there's a whole lot of science behind that. So it's only when you discover, oh, that's the reason why, and you do it in a more structured manner, then you can see massive improvements. So you still do races? You still do full marathons? 42Ks? Or you still... Uh, 28th April. Yeah? Borneo. You're going to do the full 42? Uh, you bet. You bet. Shit, yeah. dude. So you got... I, okay, you got this book out, right? Right, yep. Clearly. But a lot of it centers on the accident you had. You were hit by a car. Mm. Young kid. Early morning. Saturday morning, yep. right? May 27th, 2018. May 27th, 2018. 8.55 a.m. is when my Garmin died. The same day. I heard about it from someone sent me a message. I thought, holy shit, dude. you know why? Because it was on a Sunday morning and it was the one day that the new Minister of Finance wasn't making some controversial statement and it was a slow news day. So the media guys thought, oh, well, nothing else happening today. Oh, look. Azran got hit. Let's write about it. So it I was heard the about one it on, news day. I heard about it on WhatsApp. Right. Not in the mainstream media. Sure. Yeah, a friend of yeah. mine, Noel, yeah. right? right? You know yeah. Noel Lim, right? She right. told me, I said, shit, dude. Yeah. Was he okay? Was my second question. Right. So what happened? And how did you come back from that? Um, well, what happened? So, you know, like I normally... Was he drunk? Hard... Okay, so here's the thing. It right. doesn't matter. And I'll tell okay. you why it doesn't okay. matter. Um, you know, I go on 100 kilometer rides, 200 kilometer rides, nothing happens. This was just an 8 kilometer ride because... Two weeks earlier, May 13, I just finished Ironman Vietnam. I qualified for the Ironman 70.3 World Championships, was, which was going to be in Kona. South Africa. Oh, not no, Kona. Th- it's a okay. different race. It's not Kona. It's the uh, half Ironman distance, right? Okay. Uh, and this year was South Africa, or well, last year, South Africa, 1st September. So I installed new electronic shifters on my bike. And that was just an eight kilometer ride around the, the neighborhood to play with my new electronic shifters. And boom. Uh, you know, this car must have gone fast and hit me from behind. I completely had no idea. I have no recollection what happened. Uh, but basically, I was trying to reconstruct it with my doctors. It looks like um, the car kind of just kind of knocked my uh, right fibula. The first, like the bumper of the car hit here, breaking my your, right your fibula. Your foot, yeah. Uh, the, the, sort of the, yeah, the, the, the lower leg bone. Yeah, yeah. That flipped me. And then I went crashing s- into the windshield and, and the, you know, the, the, um, the, the frame of the car probably has my head, the shape of my head, Shit, dude. bang there. And then the driver panicked and probably braked and then pff, I got flung in front and then landed smack here and kind of cracked the skull. So Hence the scar. What's yeah. a little of that, yeah, stuff yeah. here, all yeah, kinds yeah. of uh, like 40 plus stitches. Shit, dude. Um, and so I think a couple of things. One, you know, it was, um, people may not know this, but it was extremely depressing and dark when you're lying in neuro ICU, right? Because the first two to three days, people, they, they were all worried about the bleeding in my brain. Is it going to get worse? Do they have to go in and, and drill? And in neuro ICU, they wake you up every four hours. To make sure you don't lapse into a coma. Right, and like at 10 p.m., they're going to wake you up. What's your name? What's your IC number? What day is it today, right? Okay, go to sleep <laughs> again, right? At 2 a.m., okay, wake you up again, right? 6 a.m., wake you up again. And some of, and you know, you're, you're in this ICU ward with eight other patients and everybody gets woken up, right? Bang, bang, bang. Um, and, and it just kind of really screws up with your mind. Three of my four limbs in a cast, I can't even scratch my nose. Like it really is frustrating and you're like, shit, you know, uh, what's gonna happen to my life, my family, and do I have to close down the business? Like all these thoughts. But the scariest bit is when all those thoughts stop. When it became a deafening silence, like you just 
cannot make any sense of it, right? And uh, it's interesting. My defense mechanism is when visitor hours came, and the ICU visitor hours are strict, right? At 12 noon, okay, visitors come. I suddenly transform into this cheerful person, and I ask people about work and everything. But when they leave, like, it just gets really dark again. And that's why, um, you, know, we've be, we, you know, mental health is a major issue and we don't understand it, right? That's why, you know, when, when people like Robin Williams and, and Anthony Bourdain... They take um, their own lives. Right? And they yeah. go, oh, but you're so cheerful, you're a comedian and everything. But see, we have these fronts that we put up, right? But when we can't deal with that, when we have our alone time, it is, it is really scary. Now, in a way, the one thing that I think kind of turned it around for me was here I'm like kind of lost and like I don't know what's going to happen. And interestingly, during one of the visitor hours on day four or day five, some well-meaning friends and family members come and they start to admonish me. They start to scold me for cycling on Malaysian roads. Don't you know Malaysian roads? In fact, one of them is you know one of your earlier guests, right? Um, saying uh, stupid decision. You know, like, you know, you know Malaysian drivers are reckless. You shouldn't be cycling, right? You're a father. Think about your kids. You shouldn't be taking those risks. And it just kind of really like slapped me and woke me up. I'm thinking, well, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. Do I really want to tell my kids that life is about avoiding risks, that you play it safe, or, you know what, you got to go out there and do it, and you are going to get knocked down. You cannot go through life not getting knocked down. But the one thing that counts is you got to learn to get back up. And I just somehow decided that was the most powerful thing I can tell my kids. And, not, and you don't teach your kids by telling, you teach your kids by showing, right? And somehow that was, I just decided, look, I just got to do it just because I want to shut these well-meaning friends and family members <laughs> and, and tell my kids that, you know, life will knock you down, but you got to get back up. And within a number of weeks, you're back in the saddle, right? And you're competing in a race. I remember you told me yeah, this the last yeah. time so we met. I think day, I'm going to say like day 30 or 35, I was on, back on my bike trainer, even with my arm in a cast because I just wanted to start. Day 84 was my first outdoor bike ride. Three months. Day 84, yeah. That's huge, and then man. day 174 was Ironman Langkawi again. Ah. Ah, that is huge. Yeah, man, when you, when you get a be in your bonnet and you just want to say, you know, yeah, I've got to yeah. show this, I've got yeah. to yeah. do this. And it was painful because, you know, initially, this arm could only go up 90 degrees. I couldn't lift my hand, right? Um, I couldn't do a single push-up. It was just the most frustrating thing. Um, and it was painful, like every day, physio, exercise, just like getting one more CM extension, one more CM extension, one more CM extension. And the days when, you know, it's like, like you cry when they're kind of working on your shoulder. But, you know, you gotta just, for me, just, I wanted it. Like, yeah, it's all, it's all up here, right? Yeah. Was, it, was it scary getting back on the bicycle and going out on the open road again? Um... Well, so I, 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 even before that day 84, from day 30, I just kept visualizing it. Like I kept saying, like, I'm going to go on it, I'm going to go on it. That's the reason why I decided on Langkawi as my comeback race, because, you know, it was like my fourth race. I went back to the same exact hotel, you know, La Pari Pari, uh, same course. Oh, Karina's place. Karina's place, yeah. right? Because uh, I wanted the familiarity, so yeah. that it, it just... You know, tells you like I can do this, and that was important. I didn't want to go to a new race, right? So, if you kind of manage it and set it up so that um, you know you can keep telling yourself you can do this, you've done this before. That was so important to be mentally ready. It was a much more mental preparation than it was the physical recovery. Shit, sure, dude. Well, well done, man. It's been a Huge honor to have you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I um, mean, if you can, get get the book, 30 Days in 30 Years. Where, where is it available? All, all good um, bookstores, all, I presume? All good bookstores, all good bookstores, or 30days30years.com. <laughs> what does it mean, 30 Days in 30 Years? So, okay. Um, it's a simple framework because, you know, this whole thing where I say as a startup, you gotta, your speed is your only thing that um, you have to, to survive, right? And so basically, I say, look, Traditional way of running companies, the 12 month plan, the three to five year strategic plan, bin all of that, right? Run a business on shorter 30 day cycles where every 30 days you reevaluate what's going on in the world. We gotta change something new every 30 days. But speed alone, without any kind of direction, leads to chaos. So you need a compass. 
And that compass is what I call the 30 year plan, right? Because suddenly at 30 years, you, you, you put aside all your current resource constraints and technical abilities and technology limitations and say, well, what do you want to do in 30 years, right? In, in iFix's case, well, we want to serve a billion people who don't even have TV or internet today, right? That, that, how you do that, we have no idea because in 30 years time, we're going to see new technologies we can't even imagine today. But that is the purpose that you want to solve. And, and that provides you with the direction so you know whatever tasks you take on in the next 30 days, right, does it meet that? So I'll give you an example, right? Tony was great with now everyone can fly. It's a nice slogan, but it's a meaningless. Like, yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. So in order to make it work, we had to translate ourselves. Okay, if 30 years time, we want everyone to fly. What does that mean? Number one, well, we got to get more planes. We're going to get more destinations because otherwise people can't fly. Two, we have to be the most affordable airline, right, so that everyone can fly. Uh, notice it is not to be the lowest cost. It is to be the most affordable airline. Three, well, you can be the cheapest airline, but if you're not reliable, people are not going to fly with you, right? So we've got to be a really reliable airline. Fourth, well, you can be cheap and reliable, but if you're not convenient or easy to use, people aren't going to... Um, use you right so we have to be very convenient so when you put these pillars of we've got to have presence and scale we've got to be affordable we've got to be reliable we've got to be convenient because that's the problem we want to solve that becomes the compass right so now every new 30-day project guys how do we know we should do this project or not that, uh, that project well how does this help affordability how does this help reliability how does it help convenience you make decisions right and every 30 days you stop and think okay what's changed about the world let's do something new See, the thing about creativity is it doesn't happen once a year at a planning offsite or a brainstorming workshop. That is not how creativity works. Creativity works because you keep going through 10 different ideas and nine will fail and the 10th works, right? So you can't have the perfect idea by creatively imagining it. But that's how traditional companies do it. 12 month plan. We have this big offsite. We review, we debate, we discuss, and then we set the plan. And for the rest of the year, we follow the plan. This is one column variance to budget, right? That's how we, we run businesses for the last 30, 50 years. But that doesn't apply anymore in today's framework, right? So if you bin that and you say, the only way we're going to get creativity is we're going to try a new thing every sprint. That's an amazing story, man. You've been a real inspiration. <laughs> I got a lot more than I thought I was going to get, man. So cool. thank you. Awesome. Cheers, awesome. brother. Awesome, too. Good luck. Hopefully, most people can uh, learn from all the mistakes I've made. Yeah, uh, that's the key thing, can, right? If I can help uh, people make less mistakes, then I've done my role. All right, man. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.